Hello and welcome to the course called ba Basic Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Arkvarma from IIT Kanpur. So, uh, what is psychophysics? Psychophysics is actually about measuring these different sensations, measuring the inputs that is coming from the various senses. Now, what is psychophysics? Psychophysics as the name says is psychology plus physics. So, psychophysics basically involves the determination of the psychological reaction to uh, you know events that lie along a physical dimension. So, changes in loudness, changes in brightness, lightness, uh, changes in you know uh, pressure, temperature, those kind of things and how do we really uh, experience them. That is pretty much what the discipline of psychophysics about. Uh, G. Boring basically uh, you know claims that the introduction of these techniques you know to measure the relationship between internal impressions that is the psychological experience and the external world that is the physical events that is what actually marked the you know onset of scientific psychology. If you remember in one of the earlier lectures we have talked much in detail about this that how cognitive psychology came into being, how we started really measuring what is happening in the mind space, psychophysics is certainly at the forefront of uh, you know the beginning of this revolution. Let us talk about some basic concepts in psychophysics. The problem of psychophysics actually is a bit like a paradox. You know, it requires you to objectify something uh, which is actually a subjective experience. So, your experience of uh, uh, you know uh, loudness or color etc are subjective experience. But we are trying to do, uh, what we are trying to do in psychophysics is to measure these subjective experiences. So, uh, what is a subjective experience? Uh, most uh, basic subjective experience is any sensation or any information that is you know impinging on uh, you know five of your senses. So, measuring sensations in that sense is a rather difficult task, you know, because they are not really open to public measurement. You cannot really measure, uh, you know, uh, discreetly how much pain somebody is feeling or how much uh, light, uh, you know, you are feeling when you lift up a particular, uh, you know, stone or how bright you are actually feeling the light to be. Sometimes you are very tired and you actually feel that the light is too bright, even though the light is the same that you have been using every day of your year. Isn't it? So, it is this subjective experience that we want to measure and that is what we use psychophysics for. The internal judgments, the ones which I was talking about are not really identical to the amount of physical energy uh, influencing the sensory apparatus. So, it is not like uh, you know 10 percent of uh, uh, you know a particular physical energy in uh, let us say light or weight or something is directly proportional to that you are feeling 10 percent weight you know that can actually uh, vary uh, quite a lot. I will talk about that in, in more detail as we go ahead. Let us take this example of uh, you know uh, a radio dial. Say for example, if, if there is a stereo in your house and you have a dial to really uh, increase or decrease the sound or volume uh, of this. What is volume? Volume is basically a perceived loudness, how loud the sound is appearing to you. So, you have a dial, there is a recorder, it is playing some music, you have this dial, you can turn this dial uh, you know towards the left or towards the right to increase or decrease the loudness of music from this uh, dial. Okay. Now, you will realize that this movement of the dial does not bear a one to one relation to how loud you are actually you know uh, feeling the music to be. Rather, this dial is very cleverly calibrated so that each movement increases uh, you know intensity proportional uh, to increments in loudness. So, you uh, move the dial one step and you feel that the loudness has increased. You move the dial another step, you feel the loudness has increased further. Thus, uh, doubling the volume level on the dial has to increase the physical energy by about 10 times uh, to produce a two-fold increase in loudness. So, for you to uh, you know uh, think that something is now twice as loud does not need the physical energy to multiply just by 2, it rather needs the physical energy to be multiplied by 10 so that you can uh, you know experience twice loudness. This is what I am talking about when I am saying that there is no one to one relationship between the amount of physical energy and the you know uh, corresponding psychological experience that you are having. Also the psychophysical relationships between the stimulus and the judgment depend on the particular sensory modality. So, you might have a particular uh, sensitivity of judgment uh, when it comes to light or sound 
uh, but you might have a very different uh, you know sense of ju ju judgment when it comes to uh, you know uh, pressure stimuli like pain etc pain judgments in response to uh, you know increases in uh, electrical intensity of shocks applied uh, you know to the skin grow much more rapidly than say for example loudness judgments i told you that you have to uh, really you know uh, multiply the physical energy of sound by 10 to perceive twice amount of loudness but you have to really multiply the electrical energy only by 1 by 3 uh, you know only uh, raise it by one third of the time to actually you know uh, make you feel twice uh, as painful uh, you know uh, twice as painful a shock as the original time okay now psychophysics basically tries to solve this problem by closely linking perceptual experience to physical stimuli what you're experiencing versus what you're getting the basic principle here is to use the physical stimuli as a reference system okay the stimulus characteristics are uh, carefully and systematically manipulated and observers are asked to report uh, how they are perceiving that particular stimulus i'll come to uh, you know a demonstration of that in a short while the art of psychophysics however is to formulate such a question that can get the simplest of answers you know so the questions are very very simple questions like can you hear the tone the person just has to say yes or no when the person says yes you know that the person has detected the stimulus on the other hand, can you, uh, you can also ask questions like, can you tell which tone, which tune, uh, which song's tune I am uh, playing? Then the person can say yes. And then you will know that the person has identified the tone. You remember we were talking about detection and identification in the research methodology lecture. So these are two slightly different processes. Now problems uh, of detection and identification may arise in cases of when the signal is too weak and there is too much noise in the environment. You know, recall any party in which you are there, uh, maybe one of the processions like a Bharat or something and try talking to, uh, you know, your friends uh, or people around you and you will discover that it is very difficult to really, you know, gauge what uh, the conversation is about uh, in the, uh, when there is so much noise in the background. In such cases, what one needs to do is, one needs to do the task of discrimination. So you have to actually dis uh, discriminate uh, the voice message that is coming from your friend uh, from the background of the blaring noise of the band and stuff. Okay, that is what is discrimination. So what you have to do is, you have to discriminate a signal or a stimulus from the noisy background. And this task is generally performed under uncertainty. There is a lot of noise. You have to really pick just the signal that you intend to from this lot of background noise. So, on what does it uh, depend that we can, uh, you know, detect a signal or discriminate a signal from noise? What are the factors that decide it? Uh, one of the factors that decide, uh, you know, whether you will be able to detect uh, the presence of a sound or a signal is a threshold. If you are looking at this figure here, you will notice that there is just threshold, uh, you know, that this pole vault is, that this, uh, you know, uh, athlete has to jump over. If she misses it, she will not be able to go uh, to that side. I mean, that is not counted as a valid jump. So, this, uh, you know, horizontal pole is that kind of threshold, which uh, really, you know, takes the person across and, uh, you know, uh, converts a particular jump to a valid, uh, you know, countable jump. It is rather similar to uh, what our sensory, uh, you know, uh, processes uh, are like. So, the most basic uh, function of any sensory system is to detect energy or changes in the environment. Okay, so if there is a change in temperature, you will start feeling uh, hot or cold depending on how the change is. If there is a electrical shock, if there is a change in the loudness, uh, you know, all of those kind of things, they have to change beyond a certain point for you to be able to detect it that certain point is your threshold. So, this change in energy can be of many kinds. It could be chemical, say for example, in taste or smell, how much sugar you need to add before it starts feeling sweet, uh, how much, uh, you know, light you want to have uh, till you start seeing something clearly or mechanical, say for example, uh, you know, how loud the sound, how much uh, strong the sound wave uh, should be uh, or even thermal stimulation, you know, how hot is uh, something uh, for you to feel hot, you know. Uh, so, this is basically, these are all changes in energy and you have to feel them uh, in a way uh, beyond a particular limit so that you can actually tell that, okay, now I am feeling colder or hotter and those kind of things. That limit basically which we are talking about is your sensory threshold. Now, in order to be noticed, the uh, stimulus has to contain a certain level of energy. This minimal amount of energy in order to be noticed is absolute threshold. 
So just the point where you can actually feel that uh, you know I can detect this stimulus now is the absolute threshold. Fechner says uh, just enough to lift the sensation over the threshold of consciousness. Once you are aware of something that it is there, some sensory information that is uh, enough to say that the information has crossed its absolute threshold. Uh, something like this. If you can see this uh, figure here, you will see as soon as the percentage of detected responses go above 50 percent, that is pretty much the time uh, where this absolute threshold is there. And the, on the uh, uh, x-axis, you can find stimulus intensity. So, stimulus intensity is increasing and uh, in uh, proportion to that, uh, the uh, amount of detected responses are uh, plotted on the y-axis. And at the point when the proportion of detected responses pass 50 percent, that is chance, that is a, a bit more than just 50-50, that is where you have reached your absolute threshold. The absolute threshold thus is the intensity of the stimulus that the observer can barely detect. On the other hand, there could be something like a difference threshold. What is a difference threshold? Difference threshold refers to the minimum intensity by which a variable uh, comparison stimulus must, de must deviate from a particular standard stimulus to produce a perceptual difference. So, suppose you are holding two stones in your hand. One of them is the standard stimulus. One of them is the comparison stimulus. I ask you whether the comparison stimulus is heavier or lighter than the standard stimulus. At the point when you can detect that this one is just heavier or just lighter, that is pretty much what is your difference threshold like. Here you can see uh, there is a reference stimulus and then there is a difference stimulus and the difference has to be at least about 35 percent by this figure here, uh, which is basically uh, or by actually uh, 35 percent times when the participant can say that uh, this is greater uh, or heavier, let us say, uh, that is where your difference threshold likes. The difference is uh, uh, plotted horizontally by these arrows, the DL symbol. Now, how do we determine the threshold? How do we determine the absolute threshold for a particular sense or a different threshold for a particular sensory information? There are methods to do that. The first method or the simplest method is the uh, method of adjustment. This is the simplest method in which you actually ask the participant or you ask the subject to adjust the stimulus intensity himself or herself until it is just noticed or until it becomes just noticeable. You know, say for example, until it becomes just noticeable will be your, uh, when you are measuring your absolute threshold, until it is just noticeably different from the comparison, uh, from the standard stimulus is when you are actually talking about uh, difference threshold. Okay, the kind of same examples which I was talking about. Uh, how do you do it? Let us go into the steps. So, the observer is typically provided the control of some sort and that control can be used to adjust the sound, say for example, if you are talking about sound, until it becomes just audible. So, the, part, uh, the participant is, uh, you know, uh, changing the dial in uh, small steps and as soon as the participant reports, yes, I can see it, you can stop that and then you can note down that value. This intensity is, uh, you do it multiple times and this average of this overall thing uh, can be uh, supposed to be uh, the, uh, you know, can be supposed to be what is your absolute threshold. If you are talking about, uh, you know, you can also, what you can do is you can actually uh, start the observer uh, from a higher value when the sound is very detectable and you can st ask him to bring it down in small steps till it becomes not noticeable, uh, just one step after it becomes not no noticeable. That is also uh, one kind of value we will get. Typically, these two kinds of values are alternated several times and an average is taken to get the point where you can actually barely detect something. So, that is how you determine over a series of trials your absolute threshold. Uh, another method to determine absolute threshold is the method of limits. So, a major difference by the way between the method of adjustment and method of limits is that here uh, one does not allow the observer to control uh, the stimulus directly, but the experimenter does it himself. So, if I am the experimenter and you are the participant, I will have the control and I will change the dial uh, towards the left or towards the right and I will keep asking you the same questions. Did you detect it or did you not? You will give me answers at particular points, I will note that down and I will probably do the same as I did with the absolute threshold procedure. I will probably go uh, once in an ascending way, uh, increasing uh, steps, once in a descending way, decreasing steps and I will take an uh, average of those values. Okay. 
uh, this average of uh, you know average of the intensity of the last scene and the first not seen uh, similarly in the ascending dis uh, and descending series is then recorded as the absolute threshold. Uh, here is an example. So, say for example, I am talking about stimulus intensity, let us say the stimulus be x. I start from values uh, starting at a very top 200, I start from 180, uh, you say yes, 160, you say yes, you say yes on 140, 120, 100 and at 80 you say no. Then I start from the bottom, I start uh, from uh, somewhere around 20 and I go up to 140, uh, from 120 to 140 you said yes. So, I will note that value, that value is uh, 130. I do it again from 200, again a value comes, I do it from 110, again a particular value comes. All of these values are actually average and you get a mean value of 115 which is your absolute threshold. Uh, how do you use the method of limits to determine difference threshold? The difference thresholds basically are based on relative judgments in which a constant unchanging comparison stimulus is judged related to the series of changing stimuli. So, I will give you one uh, brick to hold in your hand and I will keep giving you bricks of different weights and I will ask you when does the brick feel higher or lower, you know something like that. The question that is asked is how different must the two stimuli be before they can be reliably distinguished. The traditional way is to measure, to ask the observer uh, lift pairs of weights as I said one is constant the other is changing and to judge if the new weight is heavier or lighter. The method is uh, otherwise similar to the last instance of method of limits or method of uh, you know uh, sorry, method of limits. Uh, now one can start from a weight which feels clearly heavier much uh, you know the weights of the two things are very different and go till it uh, starts feeling slightly equal and then lighter or one can start uh, from a weight which is much lighter and then starts feeling uh, equal or uh, heavier in the next step. Uh, the upper threshold uh, you know is the average point at the one at which the observer says it was equal and then heavier, the lower threshold is when the observer says it is equal and then in the next step lighter. This difference of these two values is called the interval of uncertainty. The mean of these upper and lower values is called the point of subjective equality where you are thinking that okay, you have got somewhere equal to this, uh, equal to the standard stimulus. <coughs> this is a demonstration, so you, uh, you know have a weight which is probably around 300 grams or so and you start from 350, uh, 340, 330, uh, three, uh, you find it heavier, heavier, heavier and 320 to 310 you find it equal. So, the value of three, uh, the average of 320 and 310 is 315 that is recorded. Uh, next you start from lighter 270 and you then go upwards then you get this value of uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 315. Similarly, you do this again and again you get 3, 4 values you take mean of all of them. So, that is the mean of your upper threshold when you are going in the uh, higher series ascending series and then the lower threshold is when you are coming uh, down. So, you take the mean of the upper threshold and the lower threshold and that will be your point of uh, subjective equality. Now, this is again one way of determining this. Now, let us move a bit further. Uh, Ernst Heinrich Weber basically discovered some important properties of difference threshold. What did he find? He found that the magnitude of the difference threshold increases with increase in magnitude of the standard stimulus. So, we are asking you to detect the difference of a particular stimulus from a very uh, you know light uh, stimulus uh, that is say for example 10 grams of something then uh, say for example if I uh, you know uh, want you to tell me whether something is heavier or uh, not or lighter than a 300 gram stimulus and the difference threshold will be around 10 grams. If I ask you to uh, you know give me the same comparison for a standard stimulus of 600 grams then the difference threshold will be around 20 grams. Similarly, if I go to uh, three, 900 grams, the difference threshold will be around 30 grams. Now, if you have also noticed what I am talking about is that for a particular sensory modality, the size uh, of this uh, difference threshold is rel uh, relative to the uh, standard stimulus is uh, constant. So, the ratio of 10 grams to 300 grams is the same as the ratio of 600 grams to 20 grams or 40 uh, grams to 1200. So, that ratio uh, remains uh, constant. Gustav Fechner uh, gave a formula for this uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a situation and he, he called it Weber's law. So, there is this delta i uh, divided by i which is uh, equals to a constant that is your Weber's uh, constant. 
uh, when I uh, so here I actually refers to the magnitude of the standard stimulus delta i is your difference threshold and k is the constant. Now, this is something which is not really going to change and you saw in the earlier examples that this is actually the case. Here you can see that the, you know there is this uh, direct linear uh, increase in uh, you know the difference threshold uh, as compared to a standard uh, you know stimulus which is probably let us say background intensity or something. Weber's law or the Weber's fraction basically varies in size for different senses though. So, uh, it is somewhat larger for brightness than it is for heaviness. Uh, Weber also discovered that the value of the difference threshold is about 2 percent of the magnitude of the standard stimulus intensity, okay, around uh, that uh, value. Here you can see the difference thresholds uh, for different, uh, you know, uh, sensory modalities. So, electric uh, uh, stimulus, uh, for an electric shock the difference threshold is uh, slightly higher, for heaviness it is uh, around 1.4. Uh, for loudness it is just 0.6. So, this is uh, you know something which you can see that how this differentiates across different sensory modalities. Now, coming to another method, the method of constant stimuli. Here what happens is that the experimenter chooses a number of uh, values arbitrarily uh, that okay, I will give these uh, values 5, 6, 7 values, 9 values and on the basis of a previous explanation basically they are uh, you know suppose that the threshold will lie somewhere amongst these values. So, let us say if I guess that the threshold for a particular stimulus will be around 10. So, I will actually have all the numbers around 10, I will probably have 11, 12, 13, 14, I will have uh, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. I will present these values again and again, this fixed set of values I will present them multiple times and in a quasi random order and I will see when you can detect or you cannot detect this. So, uh, somewhere uh, and after each stimulus presentation, uh, you know, as an observer, I ask you to report whether or not you detected the stimulus or whether its intensity, let us say in case of difference threshold was weaker or higher than a particular standard amount. Now, once each value I have presented uh, more than uh, a particular number of times, let us say 20, 20 25, uh, then what I do is the proportion of detected or a not detected responses is calculated for each stimulus level. So, uh, how many responses were detected at level 10, how many were detected at 12, how many were detected at 13, something like that. Then what we do is we plot this data along with stimulus intensity at the x axis uh, uh, and uh, the percentage of perceived stimuli along the y axis. This kind of function is basically called the psychometric function. The psychometric function tells you that around what point the subject definitely perceives a given stimuli. I will show you how it is done. So, for example, here you have a particular uh, you know uh, stimulus, let us say uh, you know uh, stimulus intensity is there, there are these many values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, there are these values and then you have uh, you know uh, you presented them uh, so many times, you presented 1, 1 time, you presented 2, 3 times, you presented 3, 12 times, something like that. The percentage of uh, the perceived stimuli at all of these values is also calculated. How many times the person the perceived the stimulus at level 1 or how many times he perceived the stimulus at level 7. All of this is plotted in a particular graph which you can see right here. You can see that the uh, you know per, an amount of times the person perceived the value increases above 50 percent at around 4 uh, you know 4 and a bit more than 4. By around 7, the per, uh, person is perceiving the stimulus almost 100 percent of the time. This is again one way of determining, uh, you know, the, the point at which the person can uh, always and 100 percent perceive a particular stimulus. This is again one way of really uh, determining the absolute threshold. Now, uh, if you notice, I am going back to this figure, if you notice uh, that this figure is slightly, uh, you know, S shaped, it is not really a steep, uh, you know, uh, thing. If it, uh, if say for example, there was a steep difference between the absolute threshold and the not, uh, you know, detectable uh, value, then probably it will be an abrupt uh, change. So, for example, it will probably be more a Z like thing, okay, but it is slightly S shaped and why is it like that? This, these psychometric functions generally are uh, sigmoidal or S shaped because uh, of the fact that lower stimulus intensities are sometimes detected occasionally, uh, higher uh, you know values are detected more often and the in intensities in the middle are detected sometimes and sometimes not. So, that uh, 0.5 uh, thing is always there, it is uh, detected at, uh, by chance sometimes, not detected by chance at others. 
So it, there's not a clear distinction between the point where you cannot certainly detect a stimulus and where you can certainly detect a stimulus. Other reasons why you could get an S-shaped curve uh, in these kind of functions is probably because there is always continuous fluctuation in the sensitivity of various systems. Say for example, uh, the amount of uh, information or the discreteness with which your ear is uh, registering the loudness information also can have a bit of a fluctuation. You know, due to spontaneous internal noise and stuff like that, you're thinking of something, you know, your attention has uh, uh, varied a little bit, all of these kind of factors. These inherent uh, fluctuations mean that an observer must detect el uh, activity elicited by an external stimulation against a background level of activity. So, for example, if you are trying to listen to a bird uh, and you are sitting in a park, what you are trying to do is you are trying to, uh, you know, detect that particular signal from so much of background noise that is already going on. In that case, your uh, psychometric function will never be a steep function, it will always be a sigmoidal S-shaped curve. So, the threshold occurs with a certain uh, probability and its intensity value uh, then must need to be defined, you know, uh, you know, in a statistical way. By convention, the absolute threshold is, uh, you know, defined, uh, uh, measured, got with a method of constant stimuli is defined as the intensity value that elicits perceived responses around 50 percent of the trials. So, if just above 50 percent you can detect something, that is pretty much what your absolute threshold will be. Okay. So, in table uh, 2 which you just saw, you can see that this value lies somewhere between 4 and 5. Make sense? Uh, another method uh, you can use uh, to determine absolute threshold is the staircase method. What is the staircase method? It is an adaptive testing procedure basically used to keep the test stimuli close to the threshold range. So, for example, you have a good idea of what the threshold might be. So, what you do is you follow a staircase kind of a thing. So, you uh, uh, take hold of some values and you actually present these a very small range of 4, 5, 6 values again and again to the participant. You ask him that whether you detected the stimulus or you did not detect the stimulus. Every time the participant gives a response, you change the value. Okay. So, a small, uh, smaller uh, range of values is there so that and this is a rather efficient way of doing it because you are not doing uh, testing 100 times. This is therefore called the staircase method. So, I will sh show you how it is done. So, an observer may can start from an ascending uh, series or a descending series, each time the observer is saying yes, you change this intensity just by one step. This continues until the stimulus becomes too weak to be detected in a descending series, in an ascending when it becomes, uh, you know, uh, detected finally. At this point, so you, uh, you reverse the direction, you continue the response till the participant says, yes, now I detect it or if you are coming from the other direction, you do it till the participant says no. So, you keep alternating this direction. Usually after 6 to uh, uh, 9 such kind of reversals in direction, you are actually, uh, you know, good to estimate the threshold now. The threshold here is divided as the average of all the stimulus intensities that you presented at which the observer's response changed from yes to no or from no to yes and these different points are called transition points. I will show you how it is done. Say for example, in this figure you can see that you, you can start from a high intensity to a point when the observer's response uh, goes to uh, not perceived, then you again go one step uh, further, the observer says perceived, you come back when the observer again says not perceived and you do this. Uh, you know, a particular number of times. You just take the average of this eventually and that becomes your threshold. Now, to sum up, what did we talk about today? We talked about the concept of sensation versus perception. What is sensation? It is a part of what perception is. What is perception? It is a constructive process through which we actually make use of whatever sensory input we are getting from the world. We also talked about how using psychophysics you can actually put numbers to the subjective experiences. We also talked about a variety of methods using, uh, you know, within psychophysics that are used to determine these thresholds of experience, both absolute thresholds and difference thresholds. Thank you.